first podcast, I guess, first live podcast or interview here. And you was wanting to go by Midnight Riders, so I guess introduce yourself, tell people what you are, what you do, and uh, we'll just go from there. That works. Hey, YouTube. My name's Midnight Rider. I'm an owner operator. I've been doing this for 17, going on, getting close to 18 years. I pull a reefer. I've pulled pretty much everything out here except for RGN, cattle, and grain tankers. But I guess the big three I've done flatbed, reefer, and drive in basics. All right. So. I guess uh, we used to tell people we're not scripted. We're not going by anything. We're just kind of feeling it out here and everything. But uh, we are friends. We've known each other for a while, even though we're not telling each other what to say and stuff. But we do know each other. And uh, yeah. I was wanting to, I guess, just knock it off to get started talking about this guy. He's a subscriber. And it's similar to stuff that we talk about usually, you know, personally talking on the phone and all. How do you, you know, the history of me of why I'm not an owner operator, why I had to go right. back to company driving. This guy's kind of getting in the same boat, not to bash him or anything, not to bash myself. It just happens, you know. Yeah, we, it just happens we, the way the market is anymore, the way the freight rates have been the last two years or however many years that it's been in a slump. I mean, being an owner operator has probably got to be the toughest time. And I know there's guys out there that's going to bash us and say, man, y'all are doing the wrong stuff. Well, I mean, point us in the right direction where we can make $20,000 a week. And I think any of us out here would be jumping on it in a heartbeat, but you know, well, every I truck driver's got a story to tell. Well, like this guy that I was talking about, you know, I was reading his comment earlier when we were talking on the phone. He's got a 98 Volvo. People's going to bash him because it's a Volvo, of course, which we know a truck is a truck. I mean, there are differences in them. Some people like Freightliners. Some people are diehard Peterbilts. An older truck is, in my opinion anyway, easier to work on than like a 2024 that you have to have a whole bunch of computer stuff to work on them. This guy's got a 98 Volvo. It's got a cat engine in it. And he sent me a message saying, you know, he thinks he's got a head gasket problem and the shop's trying to rip them off. You know, right. from, from me, I've been in that same situation. I'm not going to name that guy's shop, but he ripped me off. You and I talked about it. We all talked about it on the phone. We couldn't figure it out. And that's where a lot of my money went, sunk sunk me trying to figure out this problem. And it ended up being something that we kind of think maybe that shop screwed me over on. So you I, have an opinion. You don't, like, you don't like going to shops. You like working on your own stuff. So what's what's up with that? Yeah, I just don't trust shops. I think there's a lot. There's probably good shops out there that do a quality job, but overall, I feel like majority of the shops will rake you over the fire, and you're just a one and done customer. They they know that more than likely you're not going to be back, so they're not going to probably do you the right way. And I feel like if I'm going to do something or pay big money to have something done, I want it done right. And there's been times. I'm not going to name shops, but I've had to go back through and redo what they was supposed to do originally. And it's like, well, if you're going to do it yourself, if you got to go in and do it yourself, why not just go ahead and do it the first time and be done with it? And, right. And you didn't go to school for mechanics or anything. You're, you're self-taught, right? I, yeah, I was self-taught. I've been working on trucks since I was old enough and strong enough to turn a wrench. I've, I remember getting in the driveway and getting under the truck and handing dad tools and, and, you know, I was always curious about learning how to work on these things. And, you know, I've pulled transmissions, I've done clutches, I've rebuilt engines and, you know, you know me, I got a Freightliner Classic that is blowing up right now. And I think the guy that done my counter bores didn't do them 
completely right, which part of it's my fault for not gauging them too. But, you know, what's in the past is in the past. The only thing I can do is move forward, fix it, get it back to running again. But, Well, I guess our whole discussion about this is not saying that every shop in the United States is a junk shop and it's going to destroy your business. We're not saying that. It's just saying... You know, always have your you, options available. If you can work on something yourself and you're comfortable with doing it, then by all means, I would encourage you to save a little bit of money. But some guys are out here, they could say, you know what, money's no object. I'm going to take it to Freightliner. And, you know, I know they do a good job. And, you know, more power to it. If you got tr- shops you trust, you know, I don't have a problem with taking my truck to a shop if I know they're going to do a quality job. I mean, I had a younger guy in Utah that put a power divider in my truck, and I felt like he'd done me right. And that's all you can do is hope and pray that you're going to be done, you know, everything's going to be done the right way for you. Right. And that was something, you know, another subscriber was talking to me about, you know, my channel here is trucking and politics that's what mainly the concept is but it doesn't have to be just that subject and he was a younger guy i don't know how old he was but he said he had less than two years experience i believe if if i remember the guy right and he was griping at me saying i didn't put enough information out and what he used for an example was, well, why don't you put out how a video on how to cage a break? And my response to him was, I guess I've just been lucky. I've never had to change, cage a break. I, I haven't. I mean, I've been driving 25 years almost, 24 going on 25 years. I've just been real lucky, I guess. And I've never had to cage a break. And what I told him was I did once. I I put a vice grip on the supply line and back the the brake off just to get it off of the road to get it, you know, into a shop and didn't go very far, you know, less than half a mile with it. But, right. you know, don't be dumb and do stupid stuff like that and roll down the road, you know, at 90 miles an hour with it. I, I'm not no, saying do you that. Don't, no, you don't want to get out there and get in trouble on do something that, you know, DOT will get you for, but they're not going to, I mean, if it's an emergency situation, they got a caging boat in every brake chamber brand new. I mean, which, you know, me, I take all my caging boats out and put them in my toolbox so that way, you know, because after a while, they're going to get dirt and grime in there. They're going to seize up in there. Sometimes you can't get them back out, so it's easier to get them out when they're brand new. And, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. You know, you stick the bolt in there, twist it. I believe it's clockwise. And then you tighten the nut up. And, I mean, if you if it's still able to function, you could always release your brakes. You know, leave your tractor brakes set, but release your trailer brake or vice versa, whatever you're working on. And then you might get lucky and be able to cage it without having to use a wrench and then, you know, set your brakes and it should be caged and then you can do what you want to do with it. I ain't ever tried that, but I'm thinking in my mind, you could probably get by with it. And I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to, like the guy said that I was, uh, I can't remember the words now that he, he said I was just being negative. I, I don't know if that's what he said, but pretty much that that was the extent of it. I was being negative too much, and he wanted to hear more positive. You and I talk about that a lot, and with the direction of trucking the way it's going, I mean, it just seems like there's not just a whole lot of positive to it. I mean, we're wanting change. We're wanting to change it to where it's positive, and I guess this younger guy thinks you know, we're just a bunch of old grippy truck drivers and all we want to talk about is negative. I wish we had more positive to talk about. I wish I could come on here and say, hey, you know, I got this load over here for $5 a mile. Come over here and get one with me. But it yeah. just doesn't happen. Well, you know, brokers are out to get us. I feel like we're attacked in every direction. The DOT, which, you know, I want safe roads. Everybody wants a safe road, but. You know, I just feel like we're attacked at all corners. 
to where we just don't have no breathing room. And, you know, like you said, you've been doing this for 20 something years. I've been doing it for, you know, what, 17 years. And, and we've seen the downfall of this industry. And a lot of these newer guys, they haven't seen, you know, like we talk about e-logs and paper logs and people about, well, you want paper logs so you can run illegal. People don't realize it's gotten harder throughout the years to run illegal. They got you kind of clamped down. It's just, to me, I want the freedom and not to cheat. But I kind of like paper. But then again, you know you know how I am. I'm on the fence. I like an e-log. I like paper. I thought I never would have liked an e-log. But in my classic, I have to run it. In this FLD, I don't have to run one. And But to me, it's not worth the tickets of getting out here. I'm not going to jeopardize my life and my career to run illegal. Well, but well speaking to these younger drivers what what i guess with us being older drivers i mean age wise you're younger than me but our experience is is close close to what we've been doing and we have seen like your truck that you drive your owner operator truck is a 98 right 97 97 and this one that i'm driving it's either a 22 or 23 you hear it you know, when we're talking on the phone, it's just beep, 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 and vibrations and everything, all the bells and whistles that's going off while I'm driving down the road. It's kind of insulting to me being 25 years out on the road, and I feel like I'm in a trainer truck. And, yeah. I mean, I remember driving old early 90 model trucks for trucking companies back in the early 2000s. I had a Peterbilt 379 company truck that I drove for a company in Memphis. I had to drive down the road with my hand on the door to keep the door from flying open while I was driving down the road. It was an old piece of junk Peterbilt. You know, I had 2 million miles on it. And I was young back then, early getting started. Now I'm older and I'm driving a truck that feels like I'm being trained again. And it's kind of insulting to me. And the other thing, I guess the political part of it is it just feels like I've got eyes on me all the time because these trucks are tattletales. They keep track of every single move that you make every single second of the day. They're collecting information on you. Who knows where that information is going to and who could be using it against me for whatever reason. And that's not a direction that I like to see trucking going to. No, I don't believe that some people can say, well, you are just too old school. You're not up with times. You're not hip. You're not cool. And I mean, this technology to me ain't cool. It's telling me that I don't know how to operate a truck. And, you know, I believe that people are going to get too reliant on technology to do the job for them. And what happens when that fails? you're going to have an accident. And I'm not going to say I'm an accident free driver. I've had two accidents in my career, you know, written up. It was my fault, but at the same time, you know, my circumstances, I don't believe either one of them was my fault, but you know, circumstances happen, but you know, I don't believe these new trucks are helping anything. I think it's all dumbing us down. It's like, we've talked about cell phones. We could remember people's phone numbers like no tomorrow when we were younger versus now I can't even tell you my dad's phone number. And there's times I can't even remember my wife's phone number without having to look at my phone. Right. And it's like every, everything's being done for us and there's sensors on the truck to where, you know, the, the truck, even with these new freight liners, they got actuators on the front axle. You can buy them with actuators that will keep you in the lane. I, I think that's a dumb idea. I, I don't think that's a safe idea. What if that actuator freezes up? You're mechanically minded. You know stuff like that can happen. What if it freezes and seizes up and you can't turn the wheel and, and you run into a guardrail? Then that accident will probably be deemed your fault, even though you had nothing to do with it. Yeah, I, you know, they'll say they've tested this stuff for years and years. And I think a lot of these people lie to you to make you feel safer. 
And I mean, it, it could happen. Anything can happen. I mean, mechanical failure happens every day. You know, you could have a tire rod that goes out. I mean, with maintenance, it shouldn't go out. But, I mean, we shouldn't be relying on something to keep you in a lane. You should be able to do that yourself. And that's something I've said on this channel before. A lot of people knock me. People's made fun of me in the past. But I did go to truck driving school back in the year 2000 when I started. One of the first things they told us in class was you need to be in control of that vehicle at all times. You're the captain of that ship. You tell the truck what to do, where to go, how to operate. You are in control. Nowadays, they're throwing all that away and saying, no, you need to be relying on this sensor. Well, what if the sensor goes out? Then what do you do? Yeah, I don't have an answer for it other than, you know, it's just something's going to wind up having to happen and someone's going to get hurt because of it. And it might not happen. And then it might happen. I'm not a, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but in my mindset, I don't believe in the technology. I believe that at some point in time, it will fail you. And someone's going to get hurt because of it. And then who's going to be at blame? You know, the government ain't going to step up and say, well, we're the one that mandated all these trucks have all these censures. You know, we take the blame for it. Our government won't ever stand up and take nothing or take the wrath of anything. And, you know, they keep pushing and pushing and pushing for all this stuff. And I, you know, like I've told you on the phone before, I believe that cars should be held accountable for their actions. A lot of times they're not. We see them doing stupid stuff all the time. But then if they get tied up with a truck, then they'll sit there and buy, well, that truck driver shouldn't have been there. Or they'll find some reason to throw the truck under the bus. And, you know, we have to be out here. People need our goods. People need everything we're taking across country every day. But then they'll come out and say, oh, we could live without trucks. No, you can't, because what are you going to do when you run out of gas tomorrow? What are you going to do when that shelf don't have your gallon of milk on it? You know, people and don't that, think about stuff like that. And that's something, and I know you, you probably don't think about it every day, but it just popped into my head while you're talking about that. I think... And you, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I don't, I'm not going to get mad at you if you tell me I'm wrong. But I think back in the day, early 2000s, even before that, people were more uh, lenient, I guess, when they're driving and they respected trucks more. Like if the truck was needing to swing out to make a, a right turn, cars would back up and get out of the way. And, you know, they were more responsible with their driving and, and more courteous nowadays people just sit there to stop light and look at you and you're fighting the wheel trying to make that turn to keep your trailer from going in the ditch and they're sitting there texting on their phone they could care less if you flip the thing over it's nothing to them and yeah. well that, i mean i think at one time people were taught to respect trucks you know i thought you know, one time, you know, we was king of the roads. We was looked at, I guess you could say a higher standard. People looked up to truck drivers. We were highway heroes. And nowadays, you know, they look at us as we're slobs. We throw trash out. We, you know, pee bottles and all that everywhere. And nobody respects trucks no more. But I do blame technology, phones. Everybody's always got a phone either to their ear or they're texting on Facebook. And... It just technology to me has ruined society to where we've lost touch with being able to communicate with one another. And, you know, look at how back in the day you could get on the CB going down the road and carry on a conversation for as long as you could reach out to somebody. You know, it brightened your day to get to talk to somebody, hear someone's voice. And nowadays, you know, nobody talks on the you know, CB or unless they want to trash talk and try to get somebody riled up and want to fight. And, you know, trucking used to be a brotherhood. You know, Absolutely. people, if they saw you on the side of the road, 
occasionally you'd have a few guys, you know, if you were sitting in your truck, they'd get on the CB, you know, hey, you know, guy on the side of the road, are you okay? Do you need help? You know, if you ran out of fuel, there'd be somebody that would stop and give you a couple gallons so that way you could get down the road to the nearest truck stop and fuel up. I remember being a kid. My dad ran out of uh, fuel in Arkansas. Uh, he thought he had enough to get, I can't remember where we was going. I know we was going east, and we was sitting there, and we ran out of fuel, and there's a reefer that pulled over on the other side of the you know, interstate on the westbound side, and he gave us, you know, four or five gallons of re you know fuel, and we got up and going, and I would like to say we got to Wheatley, if I ain't mistaken. Right, and, and that's, you know, something we got that that's something I've brought up on the channel so many times before, and, and I think younger truck drivers, I think it's a two, two-sided thing. I think, one, they get offended by it because in their mind, maybe we think, maybe they think we are cutting them down because they don't experience that. I'm not cutting any younger truck drivers down, and I'm not trying to throw it in their face that, you know, you're just young and dumb because, you know, you haven't experienced what we have. We're just saying that it's so much different now. They're sep it's almost like the government and corporations and stuff are separating us on purpose like this because they don't want us to stick together. They're trying no. to drive the wedge in between us, and they want this wedge between older, experienced drivers and and newer drivers, and they want this hate and fight going on all the time. I don't want it myself. I wish everyone experienced the crap that I had to go through <laughs> because well, I went you know, through some crap out on the truck. Well, I think they try to separate us, but I also think, I was telling you on the phone before we started this podcast about, you know, I believe the turnover out here. They do it intentionally so that way they can keep a turnover so they can keep the driver pay down these corporations are so greedy nowadays they'll tell you they want to hire you to retire you but as soon as you get a chance to you know make more money then they're going to kick you to the curb and i mean this is not trucking related i know a guy that worked for a local restaurant where i live and he was there for years he was the manager he was good at his job they kicked him to the curb because they said they couldn't afford him no longer but that's where i've talked about and you've talked about corporate greed how many times do you ever hear of a ceo saying we'll take a cut and pay so that way we can keep quality drivers and i know me and you are not going to be out here forever driving a truck there's going to be someone out here that's going to have to fill our shoes and you know, it's a revolving door. And, you know, I want to see new people out here and get the experience. You know, I love my job. I love driving a truck. I've always wanted to do it. I've been around this thing since I was in diapers. And, but I do believe these corporations are just trying to keep everybody down because they want to turn over. They want to keep the, the wages down. You know, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, I don't know what, uh, what would you call it? In, introductory truck driver. I don't know, or I might have mispronounced that. Sorry. But, you know, a new level truck driver coming in, I don't know. I've always heard, you know, they make a couple hundred dollars a week. Yeah, I've heard that too, that they really cut their pay down and they give most of their pay to the trainer on the truck. Yeah. And, you know, Probably you'd take a cut in pay. I don't know where you would work at, a dollar store, Walmart, McDonald's. I, I'm not saying that's the only people that could go into trucking, but I'm just saying if you're a younger person, you know, you'd want to escape that job. I worked McDonald's myself, the very first job that I ever had when I was 18 years old. I only worked there a few weeks because it sucked and I quit. But, you know, wherever they're coming from, it's almost like they're taking a cut in pay to go into trucking, you know, I, and I've told I this, they are. I said this before on the channel and a lot of truck drivers said that I was full of it, that it didn't happen. When I started with MS carriers in 2000, you know, this was 24 years ago. Now, granted, I was on a tough job. I had to do driver assist on furniture deliveries and I had 15 to 20 stops per trailer load. 
you know, and it was physical work. But I was making a thousand to thirteen hundred dollars a week back then, twenty five years ago. You're lucky to hit that. You know, I don't know of a job that you can start out with trucking right now as a fresh greenhorn that you can make that now, and it's twenty five years later. We're not progressing; yeah. we're going backwards. Well, that's like I said, that just boils down to corporate greed that. They just, they want to keep people down. And that's why I've told you before, like trucking companies, I don't have a problem. If you want to go lease on as an owner operator and lease on to someone to run for a dollar fifty a mile, that's your choice. I'm not going to get on you. Everybody's got certain circumstances that works best for them. I've chased the miles. I've chased the money and it don't work for me. And you know, that's what, like I said, you know, these companies have got it figured out to where they, got a certain dollar amount to where they know they can work you to death they expect you to run their 70 hours and i'm not saying every single company is a bad company i'm not going to say you know to me in my personal opinion i think every trucking company is about the same you've got ups and downs with them all but they've got it figured out there's a science behind it all they want to keep you working and keep you kind of down to where you have to work because they benefit from it, which, you know, that's how business does work. Because if we all made a million dollars in one week, would you want to work next week? Probably not. And I brought that the, up to one of my subscribers on this channel before. I mean, I'd say it to you, say it to anybody. If I had $100,000 cash money in my hand, no taxes, no nobody knows where the money comes from. It's just cash money. And I give it to you and I say, but you've got to sign a paper that says you'll give up your CDL and you'll never drive a truck ever again. Would you take the 100000 or would you turn it down and say, no, I'm going to keep driving? Mm, I would say I'd keep driving because people buy, well, that's stupid. Well, this day and age, what's 100000 going to give you? Because, I mean, we look at back when I first started driving a truck or when you first started driving a truck. I remember when fuel was under a dollar a gallon for fuel. Tires were, you know, a premium tire was probably $200, $300. I might be undershooting it, correct me if I'm wrong. Now, I was still young, but I do remember at one time a lot of stuff was cheap. It, you could do a lot of stuff. And nowadays, you know, to get a premium tire, what a Michelin is. I mean, I don't even price them because they're out of my taste. But what a brand new steer tire for a Michelin's probably what eight nine hundred dollars, if not more, for just one tire. I probably I think I've seen them for like eleven hundred. Yeah. <coughs> so Excuse I mean, me. you know, it's just. But I, I think the there's cost, another you side. You know, the, do the dollar don't go as far as it once did. So you take a hundred thousand dollars. You know, 15, 20 years ago, $100,000 would have probably lasted you quite a while. Nowadays, you know, a dollar, a hundred dollars, let me put, let me phrase it this way. A hundred dollar bill to me is almost like a one dollar bill now. It don't take nothing for you to throw a dollar, a hundred dollar bill out and it don't go nowhere. You go to Walmart, you buy groceries, you spend two or three hundred dollars, you walk out with a bag full. So, yeah, I, you know. A hundred thousand dollars to me would be a drop in the bucket nowadays. Even a but million I, dollars probably ain't going to get you a lot. But there's another side to that. That's what I was getting at. I mean, I, I, I like your explanation of it. But there's another side of it. I think from our side, being older truck drivers or more experienced truck drivers, we still see an upside to trucking. We still see. There's hope for change in trucking. I think there's a lot of younger drivers that don't see any hope. You know, they don't they don't see the upside to it. You know, they left a crappy job to get into trucking thinking they're bettering themselves and they didn't really better themselves. They don't really see any future in it, really. So they're like, screw it, I'd rather have the hundred thousand dollars. And you and I would say I don't want a hundred thousand because I see hope still in trucking. I, I think there's something there to be said with that because I think a lot of younger people just are losing hope. And 
it's because of all this corporate greed. I, I'm going to say this, and you can disagree with me if you want, and, and we'll, we'll be still friends, but I think you're probably going to agree with me. I think corporate executives are making more money in trucking right now than they ever have in trucking, and they just want more and more and more. Yeah, and they're not even the ones that are carrying the weight. You know, the workers are the ones that keep the company moving, and all a uh, CEO is is a figurehead. Why should they make millions of dollars a year? But then you'll hear certain companies that will come out and buy, we're, we're struggling. But like I said earlier, you don't hear of a CEO saying, well, you know what, to keep this company afloat and to get better pay for my drivers, I'll take a cut in pay so that way they can better their lives. No, these CEOs and all, everybody's so greedy are these board members. You know, Wall Street's killing this industry. You know, they at one time you had so many trucking companies that were privately owned. I mean, except for J.B. Hunt, they've been on the stock market for years. You know, Swift, I don't know how many years they've been on the stock market. Warner, all your megas are more than likely on the stock market. So there's so much corporate greed that goes from the CEO to the board members and so forth that they just suffocate in the working class to where there ain't nothing. But we let, you know, you're talking about change. We can make change in this industry, but we all got to come to an agreement on what we want. Some people are happy with e-log. Some people are happy with paper. Some people want speed limber. Some people don't. You know, I look at it this way. We live in a free country to where I'm not saying I want to get out there and run 100 mile an hour. But if I want to do two or three mile an hour over the speed limit, it's my license. It's my choice. Don't hate on me because I want to run a couple mile an hour faster. You know, everybody's got the right. If you want to do 55 mile an hour and ride in the right lane, you know, it's your rig. You're the captain of that ship. Whatever you know that you got to do to get the job done and do it safely, do it by all means. But well, we've know, got to I stand together. That's something that I have brought up on this channel many, many times. I know you haven't watched all my videos, but, you know, I get on my soapbox and I start preaching about this stuff. And this, uh, this is something I think a lot of the younger generation of people coming in don't get. They, they see this as griping too. But this country was built by individuals. It was built by small businesses because I guess that's the thing that I lose contact with is I don't know how to relate and talk to younger people like my son. I brought that up in one of my videos the other day. I've tried to talk to my son about getting into trucking and, and tried to get him involved in it. And he's got such a negative outlook on trucking. And I love my son. I don't want to bash him or anything. but you know, back in our days, like you, we were saying earlier, uh, it was like kind of glamorous, I guess, to be because we remember Smokey and the Bandit and Convoy and, you know, what was the, the Candy Cane movie? Oh, Joyride. Joy you know, people Ride looked up that. to truck drivers and it was it was fun, you know, which, you know, I don't know if your son ever rode on the truck with you. I Like I said, I've been on the truck since I was in diapers. My dad would tell me stories that when I was a baby, I'd crawl around the truck floor and, you know, if I was wanting on the bed, he would reach back there and throw me on the sleeper because, you know, back then, you know, some of the trucks, you know, back in the early 90s and late 80s, you know, they had smaller sleepers. There were some bigger ones still. I'm not saying that, you know, like this big condo I'm in, I don't, you know, my first trucks that we ever rode in was cab overs and uh, flat top FLDs. And, you know, my dad was a Freightliner man. But, you know, I grew up in a truck. So it's, of course, deep in my blood to want to be out here. You know, we've talked about my brother. That where he's always taught, I remember when we were kids, he's like, screw trucks. I would never be caught in a truck. And it's like, okay. And now here he is. He's a truck driver too. I don't know if he loves it as much as I do. And don't get me wrong. There's days I would probably throw my keys up in there and say, you can have it. But 
deep down, this is all I know. And I've got a lot of compassion for this industry. And that's where I'm like you. I would love to get people involved and start a movement. I've talked to you before. I've talked to other drivers. I've never went as far as going in and doing the YouTube channel. And I've wanted to. I just guess I've never put the thought and effort into doing it. But we got the power in this country to make a change. That's where... The brotherhood needs to come back. Just saying about your brother saying he didn't want to get into trucking. What we were talking about was getting younger people more interested. And your brother's younger than you. And it's not about your brother. It's about age. You know, like right. just a ran, random 25 year old guy or girl, either one. I mean, there's a lot of women in trucking, too. We we tend to forget about that. But there is a lot of younger women and, and I guess girls. I don't know. Is that offensive to call them girls? Young women. There, there's oh, a lot man. in truck. I don't, I, don't, I don't know how to address <laughs> a lot of stuff anymore because, you know, we're old school people. And, you know, no offense to anybody, whatever you want to be called, you know. Right. And I'm just, saying, you, but... I'm just saying a younger person wanting right. to get into trucking. With us, you know, we were excited because, you know, of the movie, Smokey and the Bandit, Convoy, Joyride, all of these movies, even goofy movies like, uh, what what was the clown face truck movie? Maximum Overdrive. Maximum Overdrive. I mean, something goofy well, you know, like that. Big, big, tr big Trouble, Little China, you know, you had uh, Over the Top with Sylvester Stallone. That was a... I mean, it wasn't really completely about trucking. But, I mean, there was trucking in it, but and then what's that other one with Kurt Russell that uh, Big Trouble Little China, which that was a goofier movie. But, but it was yeah, cool. I you know, mean, they had that was kind of our generation, even going way back. I mean, Smokey and the Bandit was seventy five, seventy six. That was a long time ago, but I mean, it kind of went along up until early 2000s but that was 25 years ago and there's not really that kind of you know glamour about truck driving so well i if think you just we're portrayed to, as an enemy you know nowadays to where you know everywhere you turn i don't remember a lot of them i do but i don't remember seeing a lot of billboards when i was like back in the 90s about truck wrecks like there are nowadays there was a guy in arkansas i'm i probably shouldn't say his name so i'm not going to say that law firm's name but they portray us as enemies of the road that we're out here just to kill people or not i, I guess i shouldn't say that that we're out to hurt people and right. That's nobody's agenda out here. I, I can't think of anybody out here that's like, I'm going to wake up and have a wreck. I don't, I, I don't, I could not picture anybody out here wanting to do any harm to anybody. Yeah, traffic does get annoying. You know how I am. I do get aggravated with traffic at times. And, you know, some people have ways of coping with it, but I don't think running over people would be. Well, like I said, like I said on the channel, not to bash anybody specifically i guess i'm being nicer in this video than sometimes i am in other videos but you've got the corporate greed on the top side you've got guys that are immigrants and illegals i just posted a video the other day a guy got deported i think it was 16 or 19 times and he kept coming back in and coming back in and got into a big truck and had a wreck in Colorado and killed somebody in a big truck wreck. So if you've got the corporate greed on one side, you've got the, the bad uh, influence on the other side. I guess my question is, and I don't even know if you can answer it. I'm not trying to, to put you in a corner here. But if you were just talking to a, a random 25-year-old person out here, that's closer to your age, how, what would you say and what would you talk to that person about to get them interested in truck driving? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, a lot of people would probably be like, well, it's about the money. But, you know, you have to love something to be able to want to do it. I mean, there are certain jobs that some people do. They make good money at it and probably hate it. I'm not going to say you have to love everything you do, but 
this is a harder job and people think that we're just out here sitting behind the wheel. I mean, there's a lot of stress that goes along with it, but I don't know what it would take to really address somebody at a younger age. You know, it depends. Do you love traveling? I mean, there's perks to this, you know, industry, getting to see things, you know, me, you don't have to commute back and forth to work every day, or unless I guess you're a local driver and that's what you choose to do. But you know, us over the road or regional, whatever you're doing, you know, I, it just, I sometimes sometimes people would have to put the money aside. I mean, we're all out here to make a living. None of us would want to do this for free. But well, I, yeah, that would I be guess. the biggest. I guess what I was trying to to get at on my channel before you, I mean, this had nothing to do with you. I was just wanting to kind of get your side of it. But so many young people, in my opinion, and I may be totally wrong about this, but they see these companies like J.B. Hunt or Prime, you know, like Prime, they give you these things. You, I know you've seen them before. They'll let, like, let let you put stickers or Pokemon or Green Bay Packers or some some kind of sticker on the truck to make it, you know, more uh, individualized just for you, you know, and you say, well, I'm proud of it because that's my truck, you know. They're doing that to get young people involved with that company, but what a lot of young people don't get is that company really don't care about you. They care about They're their just, profits. That's it. You know, you're a number. You know, that's all they care about is getting that truck to move, and they'll do whatever it takes to make it appealing to you. And I think that's where the companies are messing up. They don't treat these drivers like humans. You know, some people, we can disagree on this, and there's probably going to be people, people out there that are, you're not a real truck driver if you're not gone for six weeks at a time or However, you know, I've got a family. You've got a family. I'm a family-oriented person. I've never driven a truck and stayed gone. Yeah, I've been gone for two weeks at a time, but I've but never been it. gone for months. But you, of the times that I've known you, like you go out to the Northwest and stuff, you like taking your family with you because you knew you were going to be gone for a while, so you wanted to make like a family thing out of it. Yes, and there's so many young people out here. I think they just get, there was a time I got burned out. And I've told this story before on this channel. In 2007, that's why I became an owner operator. I got so burned out was just go, go, go. And it just made me feel like that I, I as a person didn't mean anything whatsoever. I was just a tool for that company to make money. And they didn't care what happened to me. You know, if, if I just just ran out of steam and I just didn't have anything, you know, just throw me out of the truck and put another person in the truck and go. And I just got so fed up with it. I just put my foot down and I said, I'm getting out of trucking. I don't care if I ever go back into it again. And I, I got, I guess, homesick of being on the truck. And that's when I changed and I said, I'm going back into it, but I'm going to be an owner operator if I go back into it. And I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to be just somebody's, you know, steering wheel holder, not, not to call any young person that, but I didn't want to be a steering wheel holder for a company. I wanted to have some kind of value to my life driving the truck. And I think a lot of young people, I, like I said, I could be wrong about this, but I think a lot of people get burned out really quick now because the companies are so full of greed. They don't want them to, to rise up and get better. There used to be stages. You started out as a company driver. Then you wanted to be an owner operator or a lease purchase. Then you stepped up and said, someday I'll, I'll have my own truck with my name on it. Someday I'll have 10 trucks, you know, and you saw a ladder to go up. Nowadays, it's like, I'm just going to be here and I'll never be anything else besides a steering wheel holder. I, I and, think people feel like they're stuck, like there's no more options. And, 
you know, I tell people I've had younger people or someone about, you know, how do you become an owner operator? I'm like, well, my best opinion would be if you could find a good company that does do a lease purchase where you'll actually own the truck at the end, you got to do your research and your homework. But, you know, the owner operators, I've told you once, I feel like are a dying breed. You know, the companies are out to get us. You know, there's so many lobbyists. There, It's just nobody wants us out here because they feel threatened by us. But, you know, I, t- I told that younger guy, I was like, well, if you got credit and you can afford to go buy a truck, I'd say go buy your own truck. You know, because if you go to, like, Prime or them, you never really truly – I don't know. I'm not going to say it because I'll be called a liar. You know, and if people – you know, have paid off a truck through all these bigger car- carriers, you know, congratulations. You know, I heard TMC is a good company that you can actually buy a truck through and you actually will own it. But I've heard horror stories, and you've probably heard them, that you go lease purchase, you never are truly an owner-operator. So I tell people I would be more comfortable knowing that I'm buying the truck outright, you know, well, oh, I said but then that. again, you're but then again, you're trapped nowadays because you know me and you we talked about this earlier about older trucks. I feel comfortable in an older truck. I can work on it. I don't have to have thousands of dollars worth of computers to be able to work on one because nowadays, like you was talking about earlier, a sensor goes out or a turbo goes out. You know, with this old truck, I can go to you know a turbo shop that you know well any well I'm. Truck Pro, anybody carries a tr- turbo usually, I can go yank this turbo off in, what, 30 minutes? I changed one out over in Atlanta one day on the side of the interstate. I had to walk, what, a mile, two miles to go get a turbo? And I, luckily my brother got me an Uber and I got back to the truck and put it on. And But, you know, now you got to have a computer to sync that turbo with a serial number to the truck. Or else it ain't going to work. And it's like, it's just, everything's becoming too complicated. But you also got the problem with these companies that we don't want your old truck. If it's over 10 years old, we don't want it. But in my opinion, people's opinions are going to vary. If you take an older truck, you put a new differential in it, you know, a rear chunk, new transmission, a new engine, put new bearings in it. These older trucks would be just as good as a new truck. Every truck's going to have a wheel seal, a wheel seal failure. Every truck out here is going to have a sensor or something go out. I don't see nothing wrong with an old truck. Which you know we've talked about this on the phone. You see more and more new truck or older trucks on the road, like FLDs. I see them like crazy nowadays. But that's going to be a problem with you know some of these newer drivers these younger drivers they probably i don't know there might be some of them that would think this old fld is cool going down the road there's some of them that i don't know why that guy would own it then you know some of these newer guys might love a truck that you're in well and we don't have to agree the i i mean i understand i hear so many people i watch other you know like younger people on youtube and other people and they hate these freightliner cascadias they they just don't like them they they're just too generic they're just a cookie cutter truck you get out of one get into another one and you can't tell the difference one might be a year newer and a couple hundred thousand miles less but it's the same truck i think truck drivers and younger truck drivers too they would they would like to have a w9 they would like to have a 379P, even though they get bad fuel mileage. And I, I'm not going to try to talk too much about 379Ps because people will really tear me up about them because they think that they're the greatest thing that ever was. I had one. You know I had one, and it sucked because it wouldn't get over three and a half miles to a gallon, and it ate my lunch, and I had to get rid of it. But well, That's like still, a Freightliner Classic that we had. It done the same thing. and. You know, I, but go ahead with what you're saying. But I, I guess what I'm saying is that's another thing with younger drivers, like we were talking about the movies and being glamorous and everything. That's another thing that they don't see any future in because, you know, there's nothing else to move up to as far as trucks goes. They're in a Freightliner Cascadia today. Next year, 
they're going to get a 2025 Freightliner Cascadia. Next year, they'll get a 2026 Freightliner Cascadia. You know, they don't really have that to look forward to. You know, and I'll, I'm going to have a 2026 Peterbilt 379. Well, you're not going to because they don't make them anymore. And, and these companies have, I mean, I know fuel mileage is, you know, it's all about profits, but at the same time, we've talked about this. I remember when, you know, Swift had FLD 120s. You know, I remember when Warner had their W9s. I faintly remember the cab overs, you know, which, you know what, I'm trying to thank some of the other carriers that had cab overs because back in the earlier 90s, that's what everybody had. Late 80s, you know, a lot of people, conventionals were around, but, you know, like J.B. Hunt and, uh, oh, good Lord, Snyder, you know, they had their cab overs. They had internationals. Walmart, you know, Walmart had international cab overs at one time. And Well, we uh, remember, we've talked about this before. And a lot of younger people would probably say, no, you're liars. That's not true. You and I have talked about this before. Warner used to have some of the coolest trucks on the road. They, oh, yeah, had, they some, had a variety. They had cab overs. They had 379 Pete's. They had old classics. They had W9s. Now, some of the Pete's and the W9s, they were kind of hard to, to see. They were only ran, I guess, maybe in certain areas or certain amounts, but they did have them. And some of their old cab overs was some pretty sweet looking trucks. Oh, yeah. You know? you know, trucking companies used to have a pride. There was, you know, if you had a pretty truck, it was something to be proud of. You know, I used to rag on my dad because of these FLDs. I'm not going to lie. I hated an FLD. I've always wanted a W9, and people thought, well, you know, that's where we can all differ. Everybody's got something they like. I think a W9 to me is the prettiest truck on the road. You know, I got a Freightliner Classic. Is it a pretty truck? I think it's pretty. But some people buy, how do you get a truck's pretty? I mean, you chrome them up, you light them up. Some people like chicken lights, some people don't. I love a lit up, chromed up truck. You know, I've been around reefers a lot. And back in the day, that's what you would see. You would see a reefer going down the road with all kinds of lights and chrome on them. And, you know, some people could probably care less about this, but it'd make me drool. I'm like, man, that looks cool. Right. You know, some well, people that's... out here could want a plain Jane truck, but it's just. I think it's, and this is something that people can bash me about. I don't think you will, but other people might. I think it's the corporations doing that. The corporations want to take that individual style away from it. You know, they don't they don't want you to have any of that stuff because that in their mind is competition. I mean, well, these we've talked bigger about corporations this, but... like Freightliner, you know, Freightliner's catering to all these big mega carriers. You know, you're just talking about these cookie cutter cut trucks. You know, Every one of them's doing it. International. I mean, now, International still makes, what, the Lone Star. They got that one that looks like the 9900. I don't know what they call these. some of these new trucks. I used to tell you what kind of truck was coming at me pretty much by what the headlight looked like. Nowadays, they all look the same. You know, they're bubbled up, ugly trucks, in my opinion. But these bigger corporations, it's like they're all putting, you know, locking each other in tight. Freightliner's catering to them because Freightliner, you know what, they build the Western Star, but they don't build like a truck no more that a true owner operator would really be like, oh yeah, I definitely want it. I mean, I know some of these owner operators are probably buying newer trucks because, well, you know, I I get it. You, sometimes you do have to evolve and get away from the old stuff, but at the same time, like I've said a while ago, if you go in and restore one of these trucks and put a new engine in it or rebuild the engine, which I know after a certain time, we're going to run out of the old stuff. So what are we going to do then? But besides that point right now, if you can make it work for a while, these older trucks are just as good and reliable as a new truck. Well, and, I, it's just but, more of the, I don't think it's going to last 
I, and I've said this before, I don't think people look at the whole big picture of it. Look, look at your brother's truck. More than likely, that truck started out its life. He's got a 379 Pete. More than likely, it either started out as a company truck or it was ordered by an owner operator. That guy got right. a few years out of it or the company got a few years out of it and it was handed down. And people wanted it. They were like, yeah, I'll take it. And then that company or that individual ran it for a while. They got their use out of it. They handed it down. I don't know. I don't know the history of his truck, but it, it might have had five or six owners in its life. Nowadays, these new trucks, you know, you get 500,000 miles on them and they're junk. They're just throwaway. They're like a big lighter that's run out of fluid. You just throw them away. Nobody wants them. They, well, they, I was fixing to bring that up. I mean, go back, you know, yeah, there's some owner operators that might have an older model, you know, what you'd call a newer truck. But in all reality, you know, there's, I don't know if that's a 680 or whatever they call that blowing up Kenworth, but it's the older style. You know, it ain't the skinnier hood one that they just, you know, redone. But, I mean, you think about it, after a while, you don't see the previous body styles as much as you do the new ones. And you don't see a lot of owner operators, like you said. They're not going after these older trucks. Yeah, you know, I know a guy that bought an old Tyson truck. I, you know, I don't know if this is slander, but Tyson ain't got no control over it. They can try to maintain these trucks as good as they can, but, you know, overall, it's still junk. None of these, like you said, they're throwaway trucks. They're not built to last, which these corporations, they got us as a society where they want us. I mean, your cell phone only lasts so long. A car only lasts so long. A truck only lasts so long. They want you to throw it away because everybody wants to keep us in debt. But that's what I'm saying. That can't last. That can't last because the way it used to be, you know, going back to your brother's truck, just using him for an example, you know, or use my 379. My 379 started out as a company truck back at, at a trucking company in Tennessee. That company bought that 379 as a fleet truck. It's hard to believe, but a 379 Pete was a fleet truck you know and people look at it now and oh no that was never a fleet truck yeah it was there was lots well, of you, companies you know. that use fleet trucks but now these new trucks that we've got it's just use them throw them away get another one use them throw away and get another one and they're pushing all the owner operators out they're they're making it to where the younger guys don't see any ladder to go up what are we going to do is just start stacking three-year-old model trucks up to the moon? What, what's going to happen to them? I mean, you see a three-year-old truck out there that looks new, but nobody wants it. Nobody can get it. The, their owner-operators are disappearing. And these companies just want new, 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 new. What's going to happen with all of that? We're just going to find a field out in the middle of Texas and park a million trucks out there? That doesn't make uh, any sense. Why does the corporations have to be so full of greed? I don't understand it. Because they, they look at everything as disposable. I mean, we're just numbers. We're disposable. There's somebody else that can take our place. or uh, It's just nothing matters anymore. It, it's just everybody is out for themselves and i mean you got to look after yourself but it's like i've said before about these corporations how everybody's wanting to push for self-driving trucks or these manufacturers you know knocking out a worker what are you going to do when you knock out the workforce out of a job who's going to pay for anything and how's your company going to stay afloat if there ain't no workers We've yeah. got a society that just thinks that, you know, money's going to appear and you're going to be able to keep buying stuff. But in, in reality, that's not how it's going to ever work. Or if it does, I, it would shock me. But And that's why I get so, 
I don't want to get mad and I don't want to get angry and I don't want to have hate in my heart. I don't want to wish bad on stuff, but there's so many times I just wish every corporation in trucking would just shut down, just fold the doors and shut down and just be done, you know, and well, have, I, have I this thing rise back up again where you have people that have an opportunity to be something instead of just being locked in, you know, like a bunch of worker bees out here that the queen controls them. Well, you know, I, I wish all the mega carriers to go out of business and people, oh, that's kind of selfish of you. No, I mean, they're trying to run us all out of business. So why don't we wish them? They're the ones that bring a lot of this mess on ourselves. You know, you got the ATA. They went around. They lobbied for e-logs. They want to say that everything's about keeping a level playing field. You know, people don't think about these mega carriers can go buy a brand new truck for, you know, I don't know what the prices would be. Let's say they could pick them up for $100,000, $120,000, and that might be undershooting it. You know, but I know that these bigger carriers get a really big discount when people like me and you, if we used to go buy a brand new truck, we'd give, you know, I don't know what these new hunk of junks are going for, probably 140, 150. You know, my truck I want would be, uh, you know, almost 200, but still though, these bigger carriers, they want to say an equal playing field. They're self-insured. We're not. We have to pay however much money a week for our insurance or monthly premium. And these corporations, there's no level playing field. They get big fuel discounts. They get tire discounts and so on and so on. Uh, and people you're, like, well, you're just crybabying, you know, that, you know, you're just jealous they're getting what you can't get. Well, you know, well, I'm it's not just trying they go to... around. I'm not trying to correct you or cut you off, but you're leaving a lot of stuff out too. They get tax cuts. The government gives them tax cuts because they employ so many people, you know, in yeah. their retail jobs or whatever, like Walmart. Walmart has their transportation, which is their truck, but they also have the retail store. They employ so many people, so their taxes are basically nothing. You and I both know taxes kill us. They absolutely yeah. just destroy us as a business. We we play close to fifty percent as an owner operator for taxes. Walmart wouldn't wouldn't pay probably two percent of their income in taxes. And another oh. thing people don't think about is Walmart, and I'm not just picking on Walmart here. All of these mega carriers work the same way, but they buy fuel in bulk. And I, I've heard this before. Walmart has got their fuel discount so low. I mean, they're buying it pretty much for cost or less. I don't know what that is, but you and I, unless we have a really good fuel card out here, you know, that we're using, we're going to pay three bucks a gallon for fuel somewhere around there. Walmart's probably paying like a dollar fifty, dollar seventy five for fuel. They don't oh, yeah. deserve all of the they don't deserve all of the glamour and all of the glitz just because they're a huge company. We can't compete with that. There's no, no way we, we can compete. And I shouldn't, you know, like I've said before, it's a free country. If you want to be an owner operator, I mean, we was built on individualism. You know, people if you wanted to start up a, you know, well, I mean, back in the day, you know, you'd had someone that would have made saddles for horses, you know, whatever, or wagon wheels. You know, you had the freedom to start up your own little business. You know, every town had their own individual shop or something. And, you know, you look at nowadays, it's just corporation after corporation after corporation. And I don't want to work for a corporation, you know, I mean, which we still in a roundabout way, we still work for them, not under their umbrellas but you know we haul you know like tyson or we haul just some big name brand we haul their stuff but i don't want to work for them other than having to move their products and you know i don't want to work for swift i don't want to work for warner it's just people if you're if you're happy with that that's fine you know some people are happy and tickled to death to be a company driver 
you know, being an owner operator, you know, you just talking, we just started out this podcast with, you know, maintenance and, you know, that guy having a problem with his truck. And, you know, I was talking about my classic. No, it's not all peaches and cream out here being an owner operator. It's got risk, but it is, it ain't fair that these corporations will try to keep people like us down to where they can keep their head above water, but they'll sink us just so that way we have to come work for them. Well, here's something right. for some here's something for somebody to think about, you or whoever's listening to us. I put this up on my channel before and I can put it up again. I still have it saved. Last year, eighty eight thousand trucking companies across the United States went out of business. How many Warners, Primes, Walmarts, Snyders, how many of them went out of business? None. And they're on a well, they're on a low. I mean, well, we've had some smaller or medium sized companies that's went out, but but you know, we haven't heard about it like since Arrow went out. And what's that other company that went out that uh New Century, you know, I don't know if a lot of these people remember them. You know, they shut the doors. They were a pretty decent size outfit. But it's sad to think about the small businesses. You know, look at Arkansas. At one time, it was, you know, it had a crap ton of chicken hauling companies. You know, Jmar was one of them. I, you know, I, and that's just one of them, and I can't think of all the others that have been out there. That's just one of them that pops up in my head. You know, B&D Transport, which some of these carriers were self-inflicted, you know, wounds that, you know, pushing drivers to the limit and, you know, having fatalities. And, you know, we, we blame the government also for a lot. But, you know, some of the stuff is our own doing. But, you well, know, these truck companies that... have... That's not, not to cut you off, but I wanted to add something to that right there. That is something that I had brought up to. I'm just going to say it. I don't care. I don't care if I get in trouble. It was something I was saying to a Walmart driver. He was he was running a, like a cheerleading thing, wanting to get recruitment going on for Walmart. And he was telling how great it was to go to Walmart. You go to look at their safer web and I'm not making this up. I can post it up. Anybody can go look at it, pull their DOT number up and go to safer web and look at it just in the last 24 months, just in the last 24 months, that company has had 24 fatality accidents. Now, giving them the benefit of the doubt, they may have not all been the driver's fault. You know, some car might have hit them and, and had a fatality accident. But still, 24 fatality accidents. And you can go through SaferWeb and look at a thousand small companies out here that's got 5, 10, 15, 20 trucks. Zero fatalities, zero fatalities, zero fatalities. But they want to say that is a good company it's a good safe company and i'm not trying to bash them and run them down really but i'm just comparing apples to apples how come it's like everything they do is just painted with you know bright sunny skies and we as individuals are run into the ground i don't it, that's because our thing government that, because our government is paid off by corporations. You know, we've talked about lobbyists. We've talked about everything on the phone, about how our government, you know, we talk about religion. We've talked about everything on the phone. And our government will sit there and buy, oh, you know, if me and you went up there with a $100 bill each and tried to say we want something done for this industry, They'd say, well, that sounds like a bribe, and they would try to probably get you arrested. But if we went up there with four or five of us and we each had a million dollars, we could probably get someone's attention up there to try to get something started. I mean, if we could take away the lobbyists, if we could take away where our politicians can't make no money off of anything, that they actually work for the people and quit letting them work for these corporations, things could change. But that's a big problem 
with politics is corporations are in the back pockets of them, and then everything gets, you know, they turn the cheek to things. So, you know, like Walmart with them 24 fatalities, whether it is their fault or not, it's, you know, one fatality with a smaller carrier is going to put you out of business thing near if you oh, can yeah. survive it. And I brought and, that up you know, before. I'm not going to name that guy's trucking company or name him. You and I have talked about it. I brought it up on this channel before. You know, he had an accident up there in southern Missouri. Was no fault whatsoever to that trucking company owner. And that one fatal accident shut his whole trucking company down. But then you have a big mega carrier out here. There was one I was looking at. Well, two I was looking at, UPS and FedEx. You know, two of the biggest trucking companies in the United States. I think they are the biggest trucking companies in the United States. One of them had 83 fatalities in the last 24 months. The other had like 76. I mean, that's a lot. You know, that's a lot of fatalities in 24 months. That's two years. You put that together, you know, that's a small town in Arkansas. (laughs) I mean, not to make a joke out of it. That's not to make a joke out of it. That's a lot of people getting killed. It is, but it's just sad that this government, they want to penalize people for wanting to be an independent. They want to penalize you for being self-employed. They don't, and I don't understand why. They'll about, well, y'all try to hide taxes or y'all try to evade taxes. Well, I mean, you know, you know how I feel. I've got a flat tax plan, which we disagree on how we think it should work or if it would work. It might not work, but in my mind, I think it would work. And I'll go down on that. But, you know, they they act like we're out here to cheat the system. And, you know, we're just trying to survive. A lot of us are out here to try to put food on the table and take care of our families while working for a big carrier, which, I mean, you know, I could probably go drive a truck for somebody and make a little bit more, probably a little bit more money maybe. But at the same time, when trucking's good, you know, we make money, but when you well, have breakdowns, that's what I have the problem against. And that's why I like Vivek Ramaswamy and Trump, Ben Shapiro, and all of these people like this, you know, that's pushing for this, this, not to get on my soapbox and preach, but this country was not built by corporate executives. It wasn't. It was built by individuals that would get out and cut wood by hand, put it out, you know, manual labor, moving it around. Trucking was started out by little, small. Go look at Swift. It's on their website. They do YouTube videos. Swift started out with, you know, their original owner with one or two trucks, and they built the whole company. You know, they had that opportunity and I, I'm just asking you, you don't have to answer it. It's, it's like a question that doesn't have to be answered. But do you see that opportunity? Can you go buy one truck and within 20 years, can you have 15,000 trucks on the road? It's going to be really hard for you. Oh, really, yeah. really difficult. Well, look how these big corporations swallow each other up. You don't know who owns who. You know, I was leased on to a company called Fleet Movers. They're no longer in business because they was a sister company to Tennessee Steel Haulers and an investment group bought them all out. You know, you look at all the mega flatbed companies, Tennessee Steel Haulers, Alabama Carriers, uh, that Central Oregon, uh, Lone Star. Uh, there's probably a few of them I'm missing, but they're all under one umbrella. And how's that not? And I get people about, well, they're still individually run companies. Yeah, but if you take a something and put it under one ownership, whether they're run as separate companies, to me, that should still be a daggum monopoly. Well, that's what we were talking about earlier. I I hadn't saw saw that, uh, what was it, Transport America. I hadn't seen that company in a long time. I saw one of their trucks today and I Googled it. Apparently, they're part of CFI. It even confused me to read about it. Because it was part of CFI, it was part of that TFI that was a spinoff of UPS, which is a Canadian company. And 
you're right. It, you don't know who owns what. You may, you know, some younger person that doesn't do their research and looks into it and they say, you know, well, I'm going to go to work for this company because it's not Swift. Well, then you go to look at it and dig a little deeper and Swift owns that company. So yeah, you're Swift, not, I mean, I can't even think of what some of their companies are that they own. I mean, they own, they own U.S. Express now. They own, uh, I guess, not. I, I still don't understand that. I don't know if that was a merger in between the two, you know, not in Swift. But, you know, Swift owns so many. They, they, what was that big company? I think it was what, Gordon? I think they was out of California that, uh, that they bought out. The only company yeah, yeah. that I haven't heard buying out a lot of companies is Prime. I mean, I'm not trying to prop Prime up, but they're kind of to themselves. You know, I don't know if Prime is on the stock market. No, I think we talked I about think, that once. I think I they're, they're a private still. But they're part of that uh, Wilson. Is it, isn't it called Wilson? You and yeah, your brother were talking about that one time, and Wilson and, and Prime were somehow into each other. I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but I've seen uh well well who was it a uh, jim palmer i don't know if you remember jim palmer they had if i remember right i think they had black peter bilcher they i think they had pretty trucks but i do know their trailers were black had jim palmer on them they is a pretty good size reefer outfit they is out of up north somewhere and i think prime did buy them out and i think that's how that wilson come around okay. Well, that's what if my I'm not point mistaken. is. I mean, I might be wrong on that, but right, and I, I it gets confusing because you don't know. I mean, I was looking at it on Swift's website one day. We were talking, and it was just listing name after name after name after name. It's like they own a hundred different companies, you know, and you just don't even have a clue how big of a company that is because they break it out into sections. And that's what I'm saying. Agreeing with you, they've found ways to sidestep this monopoly stuff. You know, it's not just yeah. one, one big company. You can, I don't know if you can remember that, but a long time ago, um, I think it was called bell South or Southern bell or something, something like that. Whatever it was, Southwest, Southwest Bell. Southwest but Bell. But I think, but they I own. think you did everything. I think a lot of them names. I think they was Bell South, Southwestern Bell, and I think then it went to Bell or something. I mean, I, yeah. But they had a stranglehold on the the phone companies. Nobody could compete with them. They owned everything, and the government finally stepped in and said, "Look, enough. We got to break you up. Nobody can compete with you." And they were like, well, we own these different companies and everything. And they're like, it doesn't matter. You still own everything. You've got to break yeah, it up. That's... You've got to give somebody a chance. And that's where the government is failing us with trucking is because they're letting these great, big, huge corporations just smother and suffocate everybody in trucking. And they won't step in and do anything. Well, it's you like, know, you know, w talking about Wall Street, some people might be a cheerleader for it. I don't like Wall Street. I don't like investment groups. Tr to me, these investment groups are buying trucking companies out because we're a tax write-off. You go buy a new truck, a new trailer, new tires. Everything you can do with owning a company, trucking company, majority of it is a write-off. And that's all the trucking companies are to these daggum investment groups. They're a way to lose money to keep from paying taxes, and then they run them in the ground. They could care less about the employees as long as they get their write-offs to keep their stupid investment group going. That's all they care about. And, you know, I'm, I'm against Wall Street. They've killed so much of the industries out here. I mean, they've gotten the majority of the trucking industry. They've taken over all the hospitals. You know, I was telling you about that hospital there locally where I live. It used to be owned by the county. It's not owned by the county no longer. It's owned by a corporation or, a wall, you know, an investment group. And right, and that's the thing showing that we can't compete. I guess that's what all of this whole conversation's turned into is being not being able to compete. If 
I mean, it, it's like the government has got it like this under control, like CSA. You know, and people say, well, you're just going off on a crazy tantrum now. But CSA, like we said, you have one fatality as a small company, you're done. You have a big corporation, you can have 70 fatalities in two years and you're satisfactory. You can have a great big, huge company out here. If they want your smaller company, they'll just gobble it up and buy it out and you're done. We we can't go out and buy Swift. There there's no way that I could have. I couldn't imagine how many hundreds of thousands of or millions of dollars rather that it would take to buy Swift. And even if I did have the money, they would just look at me and say, "No, nope, we reject your offer. You're not going to buy us." Yeah. So we, I mean, well, no matter what when, we do, when, we can't compete. Well, like we've talked about on the phone, when is enough enough? We've talked about Bill Gates. We've talked about Warren Buffett. You know, we've talked about Swift. You know, we, we can bring up like J.B. Hunt, CEO, like her making $14 million a year. When is enough enough? You know, $14 million a year, I think I could take that for three or four years and probably be set for the rest of my life. Majority oh, yeah. of us will probably be set for the rest of our life. And, you know, it's like our government. You know, our politicians, they go in there dirt poor. They come out filthy rich. And a lot of people just kind of shrug their shoulder like, oh, well, you know, it's part of the game. You know, no, it, you shouldn't go in and become rich. And then... Like I said, they cater to these companies. You know, you just brought it up like with the CSA scores. One, like the company I'm leased to, one bad accident or one bad inspection will ruin your safety score for a while. But Swift, Warner, all of them can have who knows how many. I bet you for a week solid they could have bad inspections. And it ain't going to affect their safety score. And there's something else that a lot of people don't know. And I, I don't know if you know this. Have you ever went by a Warner terminal, a Swift terminal, any kind of big, huge corporate terminal? There's hundreds of trucks parked out there. I think they're doing that on purpose. And that may be me trying to lead somebody down a conspiracy theory, but they'll list out there, you know, they've got 20,000 trucks and 20,000 drivers, but that might not be true. They may be using all of those trucks as, you know, a cushion for their company. That way they could get, you know, 5,000 bad inspections. And they say, oh, it's okay though, because we've got 20,000 trucks. Well, they don't even have 20,000 drivers. We've, we've talked about that before. Back in the day, a lot of younger people don't remember this. You couldn't go a mile without seeing a Snyder or J.B. Hunt truck. They were everywhere all over the country. Nowadays, you can go all day long and see like one or two Snyder trucks or J.B. Hunt trucks. They're not out here anymore, but their terminals are packed full of trucks. I think, you know, I think somebody needs to research that and look into that because I don't really think they have that many drivers. They and might I know. Not. I mean, you don't. Well, I mean, we was talking about a lot of the carriers. I mean, Swift, you see a little bit of. You don't see. A, I mean, I see a lot of California trucks. I see a lot of, you know, I'm not. I say owner operators are dime breeds. You know, I think there's a lot of. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know how to say this without sounding like a horrible person but you know like the canadian trucks you see a crap ton of them down here the mexican trucks coming up i you know i've told you what how i feel about that i feel like it's killing off the american trucks because they can go back to canada or mexico with the exchange rate come down here run and eat the cost of you know fuel and pray and hope they don't have no tires or nothing and then they can take it back to Canada or Mexico and interchange it with their money. And then they're sitting there, you know, with a killing. And, but, you know, thinking of the mega carriers, though, you, 
I know they're out here because majority of them are pulling Walmart. You know, because you think about Martin, you see them pulling Walmart trailers. You don't see a lot of their over the road trucks no more. I mean, I'm I'm I, thinking of Crete. I see Schaefer pull. You know, Crete. Or, you know, they're the same corporation, but pulling the reefers. But you don't see a lot of Crete going up and down the road like you used to. I mean, really, a lot of the mega carriers you don't see a lot of. And they're it might be just I'm not in the wrong. Well, that they, is true. They they're using a lot of the railroads to transport their trailers and stuff, but they don't have. That's why I'm getting at they. I really don't think they have the drivers. I don't think they have. They're buying these trucks just to inflate their numbers, you know. And no. you and I've talked about that before. There was a company got shut down for that, Celadon. Because they were cooking their books. I mean, that's not me making that up. People can read about it and everything. They got shut down because they were overinflating their numbers and cooking their books. And they were trying to make it look good to investors and say, oh, look at us. We're doing so great over here. We're, we're the best trucking company there ever was. And really, they were kind of a bankrupt company, you know. Yeah. And I think there's more of that going on than what people realize. I think well, these they probably, companies. Well, you, well, well, if they call it assets, you know, you can say I got ten thousand trucks, and a bank will look at it and buy. Okay, you know, you know, using it for collateral. Or so, you know, I think that's all they're doing. They're selling their companies, not you know, just saying they're selling out, but they're selling it to a bank to say. You know, give us capital, and you know that's all. Really, that's all everybody runs on, I guess, anymore is capital. You well, know, that was nobody runs on a week to week. That was one of the things that they brought Trump up on charges for, because they said he overinflated his uh, his business down in Florida, that Mar-a-Lago. They said that he overinflated the price of it so he could be look good on you know, towards investors. And they, I guess they prosecuted him over that, you know, brought charges up, fined them, you know, millions of dollars over it and everything. I don't hear about them investigating some big major, you know, corporate trucking company for doing the same thing. Who knows no, what's not, really going I on mean, with them? There ain't nobody, there ain't no oversight. Our government only wants to target whoever they feel like they want to target. You know, they're not going to go after Walmart. Walmart employs too many people, which we've talked about that. They're not going to do anything to try to knock what jobs we do have out. But I, I feel like they, they'll target whoever they feel like targeting as long as you're a smaller outfit. You know, they, they it's just, it feels like there's an agenda. You know, which, you know, my dad has always claimed that eventually it's going to come down to four mega carriers, four mega, you know, like in every sector. You know, we've talked about the automakers, you know, how at one time there was people that was trying to build, you know, automobiles and they got crushed by either Ford or GM. And, you know, just think about. Well, look at our big trucking manufacturers anymore. There's no American-owned truck manufacturer that I—I I mean, we've talked about Kenworth. That I think we looked yeah, at they, them once. That they're they keep by, say they keep saying Packar is owned by an American company, but it's institutionalized. It, it's you know corporate. And everything. They'll probably is. well, they'll probably say like Pack Car USA. I mean, that's I think that's where the people get confused. They'll say, you know, you know, a lot that of one, companies will say that they're that one's an you know, iffy, I iffy thing. Their Pack Car is, but, but international, you know, international is, is German. You know, Freightliner's owned by the Germans, and. Uh, what Volvo. Other manufacturer? Volvo, I mean, and they own Mac. So I don't know. I feel like our country's gotten torn apart by corporate greed. And it's and it's really trickling down now into the trucking industry. You know, I got a friend that works for, I don't know if this even needs to be said. I probably won't even say it. I'll leave this one out of it. But 
you know, you don't know of all these trucking companies that are American owned anymore. I mean, what, t- uh, uh, T Force, you know, they're Canadian. And USA Truck was on USA got, yeah, the Germans bought them out. And, you know, at one time, you know, JB Hunt was wanting to sell out to the Chinese. And the federal government put a stop to it. But then again, here we are. We're letting all these other companies sell out. And it's like, oh, well, I mean. There's Chinese we, trucking I, company. It doesn't get talked about a lot, but I do a lot of videos about stocks and stock market and stuff like that. But there's Chinese trucking companies on the U.S. stock market. And I don't get that. I don't. I haven't really looked into it that much to find out what that's all about, but there are Chinese trucking companies on the U.S. stock market, and I'm like, why? 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 Why are they on the U.S. stock market? Uh, yeah, that, I don't get a lot of the stuff. I mean, it's like you know, I'm pro-American. I I wish we could bring back all of our, you know, all of our manufacturing back over here. You know, there used to be a sense of pride, whether you're conservative or liberal, whatever it is. But at one time, there was a pride that this country had. And you didn't have to be racist to be pro-American. But now, I feel like you're attacked if you're wanting to be a pro-American. They'll buy, well, you must not care about anybody else. No, I mean, I care about the whole world, but, you know, you can't take care of the whole world. Everybody Uh has to be... Well, people can take what they want to out of this. I'm going to add into the conspiracy theory. I say all the time, I I don't buy into conspiracy theories and everything, but the last Democrat that was pro-American was Kennedy, and he was killed in Dallas, Texas. That's my take on it. And they they can bash me all they want to for that, but you listen to Kennedy's speeches. You listen to what he said. He was more conservative speaking than what trump is and he was a democrat and you haven't heard a democrat since then talk like what kennedy talked like and they that's when they started changing and all of this corporate greed you know we've talked about that where did where did the country go wrong in the past and there was several different places you can look at but in i guess recent history if you want to look at it as recent history 1963 is when he was killed, but that was really when everything really went crazy. And just a few years later, under Nixon, we started trading with the Chinese. Yeah, you know, and then he made what that gets deal. me with the Chinese is, you know, they flaunt around, but, you know, this will be, I know everybody in the world can listen to this, and I don't care. America put China on the map. Ever since World War II, we saved China from getting overtaken by Japan. And they repay us by throwing it in our face. And, you know, Japan was conquering China. I mean, if I remember right in history, you know, Japan was overtaking them. And we send our jobs over there. We send our, you know, everything over there which, you know, it's corporate greed. You know, they want it built for nothing, and then they want to bring it back over here. They'll build it for a penny, bring it back over here, and want to sell it for $100. You know, they'll have a hundred, you know, a 99. I don't know what you, I'm not a math person, but, you know, that's a pretty big markup. And that's why Trump wants to put tariffs on them. And people are screaming, saying, why do you want to put tariffs on it? It's going to hurt the American people. No, it's not going to hurt the American people. Because it's going to hurt where it's coming from. He's wanting to to sock it to these uh, corporations like they've been socking it to us. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just what's that's what I would just want to just get on the top of a building and scream my head off like a lunatic. What's wrong with buying a made in America product? What's wrong with it? Well, you know, at one time, I mean, people, we can bash Walmart. You know, everything that Walmart sells is, you know, Chinese made. You know, you look at the TVs, they're made in China, which that, to me, that ain't Walmart's doing. They're just selling what Americans want. They're selling TVs, VCRs, which that's a lie. That's something that we would have bought back in the 90s. But, you know, DVD makers ain't even, I guess, a thing no more. But it's just, 
you know, we we can blame Walmart, but I remember back in the 90s, Walmart had on their mud flaps and on their trucks, bring it home to the USA was their slogan. Right. And I don't know. It, it's just. Well, people want every, cheaper products. I mean, that's true. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not well, going to try to cut it any other way. If you were going to go out, now, maybe tools might be different. You know, we're kind of mechanically minded, and we like good tools. So, but still, we buy Harbor Freight cheap Chinese tools sometimes, and usually they'll break. But regardless, if if you want good tools, more than likely you're going to have to buy German or American-made tools because right. Germans make good tools too. But anyway, besides that, like clothes, shoes. Even tires for big trucks and everything. We're going to try to get a, the good quality at a cheap price, and that's going to get China involved in it. Oh yeah. But but if you just had like the old trucking saying the, all the years ago, we need to have a level playing field. If China had an even playing field with American-made products. I would pick the American-made products because they're probably more than likely going to be built better. More than likely. Because China yeah. just sends junk over here. Oh, yeah. Well, like I said, these corporations earlier, we've talked about these throwaway trucks. Everything out here is meant to be thrown away. You know, a TV don't last you nearly as long. You know, I bought a Samsung TV and bumped it, and it's got a couple spots on it. And I'm like, you know, great. You know, it's only like a year or two old TV now. And it's, it's just, but nothing's made to last anymore because they got it figured out. If they can make you buy it again, you know, they don't want something that's going to last you five and ten years. They want it to last two or three if you're lucky. So that way you got to buy it again. It's just like we talk about trucking, you know. We talk about the interstates. I remember when the bridges, you could go from the roadway to a bridge and you could never tell that you left or got on that bridge. Nowadays, you know, in Arkansas, especially over by West Memphis, you got some bridges over there. If you hit them on 40, it feels like it jokes your truck up three foot in the air. I mean, they're rough. And, yeah, I've heard rumors they got asphalt out there that could last for years, but the government won't let them release it because they say it's job security for these construction companies. And I get it, but that's the biggest problem is we've, as a country, we've run all our jobs off to overseas. So now all you have over here is truck drivers, mechanics. You know, of course, you got a shit ton of lawyers because everywhere you go, you say, oh, I don't know if I can say the S word, can you? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay, well, I, I didn't know. I've been trying to wash my mouth. But, uh, you know, you see these billboards everywhere. We've become a, in, a, a, a nation to where we sue. That's everybody's go-to thing to make money. We sue. But we've run all of our industry off. So there's very little jobs over here, which people buy. Ah, you're full of it. Well, I mean, we don't manufacture over here like we once did. And it reflects in the trucking industry. I mean, you go look at the load boards. I was looking at loads tonight coming back out of here since my company don't have me on a load yet. And, you know, Atlanta didn't show much of anything. And the rates are just, they're horrible. Which, you know, that if we want to jump back away from politics and get back into the trucking side of things, I hate brokers. I think they're a bunch of thieves. They steal from us they lie to us and i'm not going to name company names because then they could get me for slander but you know there's i i don't trust brokers i think well, there's a lot of money out here it's just brokers are keeping it all there's something going on with that latest one that shut down and i don't understand that it was called usn or usl or something like that it was part of universal truckload it was their brokerage. And I had booked loads with them before previously when I was an owner operator. And they just all of a sudden announced that they were shutting down. Something is weird with that. I, I need to read into more of that and study more about what happened with that. Because 
is very odd. It, it's not odd for a trucking company to shut down. That that anymore is just people look at that and they're like, oh, okay, well, another trucking company shut down. But for a brokerage to just come in and just shut down like that, that's odd. That's that's weird. Maybe a smaller little mom and pop style brokerage, but that's, I think, a fairly decent sized uh, brokerage that had ties to a large trucking company that's on Wall Street. And for them to just yeah. shut down like that, there wasn't any talk about it. It was kind of hush hush. It made it to the news circuit a couple of times, a couple of stories, and then it was just gone. And I caught it and I thought, what is going on with that? Because that is very odd. It's real weird to hear that. That would be like, you know, hearing just J.B. Hunt shut down. You don't really hear of stuff like that happening. So I, I would like to know what happened with that brokerage because I don't think they ran out of money. Maybe that, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I mean, I could only uh, assume what happened to them, but that's that's kind of odd to me. But anyway, I mean, I think we covered quite a bit of stuff. We've been on the phone for yeah, one hundred and four minutes. One hundred and four minutes. So I think <laughs> people's gonna be, be sitting there thinking, "Man, this will be the longest video I've done so far." But anyway, I appreciate you being on here and talking to yeah, me. Yeah, thank you. 